Today is October 15th. It's the 289th day of the year, and this is the On This Day podcast. Today is Global Hand Washing Day. I'm kind of a fanatic when it comes to hand washing. In fact, oh, hold on, I'm, I'm just going to pause for a sec. Okay, just wash them again. Great. It's best to use an antibacterial soap when you, uh, oh, hold on a sec. And I'm back. Okay, washing your hands is one of the most effective and least expensive ways to avoid catching some kind of bacterial infection, be it pneumonia or something more gastrointestinal. Hand sanitizers are good, but there's nothing quite like soap and water to... Stand by one second. Okay, that's better. Nice and clean. A package postmarked on this day in 1888 is delivered to George Lusk, chairman of the Whitechapel Vigilance Committee. Lusk and his fellow businessmen are unhappy with the level of police protection in their London community. Recent gruesome murders have had a negative impact on their local commerce. Taking matters into their own hands, they patrol the streets at night. As chairman of the Vigilance Committee, Lusk's name appears in newspapers and on posters asking the public for information, any information, leading to the identity of the killer. This publicity makes him a target for threats and practical jokes. When Lusk opens his package, he initially doesn't take the contents seriously. The package, wrapped in paper, is a small box roughly three and a half inches square, and it reeks. Inside, Lusk discovers a handwritten letter and some sort of meaty remains. Not one to scare easy, his first inclination is to just toss it. But Lusk pauses and instead places the package in a drawer. The Vigilance Committee meets the next day. Lusk shares the package. The letter, according to its author, has been written from hell and states, quote, Sir, I send you half the kidney I took from one woman, preserved it for you, t'other piece I fried and ate. It was very nice. I may send you the bloody knife that took it out if you only wait a while longer. Signed, Catch me when you can, Mr. Lusk. Unsure if the remains in the package are indeed half a kidney, the committee decides a doctor must take a closer look. Pathological curator at the London Hospital, Dr. Openshaw, examines the remains under a microscope, determining it is indeed the left kidney of a human adult. This revelation leads to the recollection that the fourth murder victim, Catherine Eddowes, was missing her left kidney. The package is taken immediately to the police. The Lusk letter, also known as the From Hell letter, is not the first correspondence from the supposed serial killer. The news and police have been overwhelmed with hundreds of letters previously, many of them hoaxes. Of all these letters, only three stand out in importance. The Central News Agency receives the first of these letters, the Dear Boss letter, in late September. By then, Whitechapel residents have been living in fear for weeks over the murder and mutilation of two women. The newsmen sit on this letter for a couple of days before sending it to Scotland Yard. The police receive the letter on September 29th. Early in the morning on September 30th, two more women are murdered within less than an hour of each other in what becomes known as the double event. Catherine Eddowes is one of the victims. The next day, the Central News Agency receives a postcard, dubbed the Saucy Jack postcard. The handwriting is similar to the Dear Boss letter. Both reference details of the double event, implying the author had prior and first-hand knowledge of the crimes and both are signed by the author's self-appointed trade name, Jack the Ripper. Hoping for public identification of the handwriting, 
Police published the letters in the newspaper, resulting in hundreds of letters for police to analyze. And Jack the Ripper becomes infamous. Yet this third letter, the From Hell letter, is different. Police consider it to be the most authentic of all the letters, perhaps even genuinely from the killer. It stands apart for several reasons. First, it's sent directly to George Lusk and not the newspaper or police. In fact, there's no mention of the police nor the British government in this letter. It's possible the writer has personal animosity towards Lusk and or the Whitechapel community. The handwriting is also different, and the letter's not signed with the sensationalistic Jack the Ripper moniker. Though the first two letters contain spelling and grammatical errors, the From Hell letter is written at a lower literacy level. The writing style is cramped, and the many ink blots indicate the writer is uncomfortable using pen and ink. Some insist it's the work of a partly functional but deranged individual. Others argue against this opinion. Linguistic clues in the letter indicate the author is either Irish or of Irish extraction. In particular, the word preserved is spelled as it would sound with an Irish accent. Preserved. P-R-A-S-A-R-V-E-D. This linguistic clue is particularly intriguing. The day before Lusk receives his package, shopkeeper Emily Marsh has an unsettling encounter with a man. She describes him as slim, six feet tall, with a dark beard and mustache, speaking with an Irish accent. Inquiring about an address for George Lusk, he writes it down in his notebook and leaves abruptly. Lusk, in fact, comes to believe his house is being watched by a sinister bearded man and requests police protection for his home. Is this man the nomadic Irish-American quack doctor Francis Tumblety? Residing in a Whitechapel boarding house during the Ripper murder spree, Tumblety suffers from mentally ill notions of grandiosity. Police have multiple encounters with him, and he's known for his strong dislike of women and his affinity for collecting body parts. Tumblety falls under strong suspicion because it's not just the From Hell letter, but the kidney that accompanies the letter, which makes this correspondence seem more authentic. Pathology determines the kidney belonged to someone who had been alive just three weeks before. It also reveals kidney damage as a result of considerable drinking. Catherine Eddowes, Ripper Victim Number 4, spends her last hours alive sobering up in the drunk tank at the local police station. Released at 1 a.m. on September 30th, she's last seen alive standing with a man near Mitre Square at 1.35 a.m. Ten minutes later, she's dead, her body mutilated, her left kidney removed. Tumblety is arrested November 8th on unrelated charges of gross indecency. He makes bail, and while awaiting trial, the police grow increasingly interested in him for the Ripper killings. He skips town November 20th, heading to France under a false name, and then to the United States, where he takes up residence with an elderly female relative in Rochester, New York. We may never know if Francis Tumblety sends the gruesome package to George Lusk on this day in 1888. Modern-day experts in criminal profiling and forensic handwriting analysis periodically review the evidence, and though he remains high on the list of Ripper suspects, the case remains one of the greatest unresolved murders in history. There are 77 days left in the year. On This Day is produced by me, Dave Schultz. Thank you very much for listening. Today's episode, written by Elizabeth Schultz. Hashtag Lizzie B. She likes the darker material, and I like the way she writes it. Born on this day in 1844, German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche. He develops the concept of the Ubermensch, Superman. Also born on this day in 1943, Penny Marshall, the actress best known as Laverne DeFazio on Laverne and Shirley. And later, she directs the movies Big, Awakenings, and A League of Their Own, among other great films. So if you're still listening, there are no facts, only interpretations. Talk to you tomorrow.